Right, so br brief introduction, who am I, what do we do? As a company, uh, we, the main business is a, a wholesale food business. We supply lots of nice food to farm shops, garden centres, delis, food halls across the UK. There's a selection of some of our products and the type of customs we go to. Um, in the last financial year, we shipped 1.8 million cases to over 2,000 retail sites. If you shop in farm shops, uh, you're probably buying some of the products we've put there. Um, we've got a, an outsourced logistics team, big warehouse, couple of warehouses and uh, office-based team. In just after COVID in June 21, we opened our own retail business as well, which was interesting and challenging building that during COVID. Um, <laughs> it was about nine months late opening in the end. And that's based in Bristol, actually, on the, on the A4 between Bristol and Bath called Flourish. Um, it's, it's not a farm shop. We, we try and, um, it's, on, it's a shop on a farm, but it's, it's a dead farm. So we don't call it a farm shop, just a food hall. But we obviously try and be as good as we can. There's very little plastic in the fruit and veg area. We do sell meat, apologies to the vegans. Um, all the stuff in the, in the food hall is, is from our wholesale business and, um, We've got a 115 cover restaurant and then we've opened a sustainable home and lifestyle shop uh, more recently at the end of last year. We are a business that puts purpose before profits. And this is really what all I'm going to have time to talk about in the limited time I have this morning is putting people and planet first doesn't mean that you have less profits. Actually, it means you have a better, more successful business. And that is the only way of being successful, really, in, in five years' time, I believe. We did, conveniently, for this talk, and the many others I do, we did win the Lloyds Bank Purpose Before Profit Award. This was out of about 600 businesses, and we won that trophy. And I met the legend, who is Trevor McDonald. I've always wanted to meet that guy, and he was the one handing the trophy out to us. So how did we get into all this? Well, I came into business from the, the world of charity. I worked for in the inner city in London, Southeast London for about 12 years. Massive deprivation. I, I've probably been to prison 50 times, not as a prisoner, but mainly to visit people I knew in the community who got banged up. We had a drug project, we had kids projects, we had old people's projects and it was, and you know this if, you, if you've ever you know, worked in an area like that, incredible need, incredible poverty, incredible you know, need for change in a place like that. Charities are great and do fantastic work, but at the end of the day, they are mopping up mess <laughs> that's been created, either by business or by government or other situations. But... It was, it was striking. I mean, we, we, met, we saw some fantastic things happen, don't get me wrong. We saw, did see lives change. But when the funding ran out, I knew that I had to earn some money. Um, according to a survey I did, I was unemployable by this stage because I'd only ever had a proper job for two years. So I started a business. But at the heart of that business, um, which started in a small lockup in, in Reading, we wanted to make a difference. So we, of our first five employees, we employed someone who just came out of prison, uh, someone who was recovering from a drug addiction, and someone who was a recovering alcoholic. Of our first five people, 60% were people who had needs. Now, I don't recommend that, by the way. 60% too, too much. <laughs> I don't know what the number is. Timpsons take on 10% of their people out of prison, which is probably more realistic. That's a business that's based near here as well. So we wanted to make a difference. We were making a difference. My business partner left after a couple of years. We weren't making any money. Not a surprise in a startup. And I'll be completely frank with you. I lost. It was still in the DNA. But really, on my own, I was really focused on just making the business financially stable and I say lose purpose that might be a bit harsh I mean it was still there in my heart but in terms of reality maybe maybe not very this is 
going through 10 times quicker than normal. So um, I went, we were making some money after about 10 years, and I took my daughter to a very poor rural community in Kenya, Western Kenya, near the Ugandan border, Lake Victoria, um, home of Bay Area, if anyone knows it. And absolutely blown away by what I saw there. I'd never really been to a place where people had absolutely nothing. And a few deep breaths, because I normally get emotional at this point, and it's happening again. So just bear with me. Um, came back to the business, and we thought, well, what can we do to help this community? I, I knew of them through some friends of mine. Um, that's how we ended up there. And came back and started talking about it after a couple of weeks, because I couldn't say much for two weeks because I was crying too much. Um, and someone in the business who only worked three days a week said, I'll tell you what, I will give my other two days a week to running a charity ball, which she did. Uh, she was called Holly. So we had our first ball. We raised 25,000 quid and started a farm, actually, in Western Kenya. So I then became a farmer. <laughs> um, I've since employed, used one of our suppliers, who is an actual farmer, to, to help me. Um, that was a few years later. But we started to make a difference in Western Kenya. But the, the reason for telling the story is that made us a better business. It's because people then were coming to work. That Yes, they were doing the normal stuff they do at work, and they were helping us make profit. But they, we were also contributing to a place where they knew they were lucky because these other people had nothing. And some of this is from hindsight, and not everyone bought into this, but I would say about half the people who worked for the company, there was definitely a new spring in their step as they came to work. They, the, the fact we were doing some good made them more happy, more fulfilled about being at work. We then had a massive meltdown. Um, won't go into the details, but it was horrendous, almost lost the business. Uh, by this point, we were, revenues were about 10 million pounds, about 50 people working there. And I thought we were probably about three weeks from going under. Won't go into the details. It is in the first of my books, Forces for Good, that story. And worst, worst time ever, but in hindsight, best time ever, because all the people that weren't really with us left. I was a bit of an idiot, to be honest, before then. Um, it changed me. I think those kind of trauma experiences, even though they're horrible at the time, were always better people after they've happened. So now, in hindsight, best thing that ever happened. We had th three years of no growth at all. That had never happened before. But we were kind of rebuilding the business. And it was around, in that time of no growth, I discovered B Corp. My first thoughts were, it was, does anyone shop at um, Buy Cook Meals? Yeah, they sell them at Holly's down the road, apparently. Um, Ed is a friend of mine who's the founder of Cook, and he said, Paul, you need to look, at, look into Beacle. This is in about 2014, end of 2013. I said, Ed, it sounds a bit American to me. Not sure, <coughs> you really? Um, anyway, I did look into it, and for me, it was everything I ever believed about business. These people believed. I, did, I thought we were the only ones trying to make a difference. Probably very naive and egotistical, but wow, there are some other people that believe in this stuff and are actually have really successful businesses. Brilliant, let's join the family. We did, and we became one of the first B Corps in the UK in 2015. And since then, we've never looked back. You can see how the growth has gone since then. And we do loads of stuff. I haven't got time to talk about all this, but we, 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 we had, I did bring, this is gonna make a noise when I walk past there. I did bring uh, one of our, a few of these impact reports, which I'll put at the back. But this is, um, all the stuff we do, and we produce one of these each year. There's a couple of others at the back of the room, but when, we, when I get that, 
which we generally produce about June time, that was one of my favorite days of the year. Because you look back and see what we've done in a small way to make the world a better place over the past year. And when we first started producing those, it was mainly stuff that I'd done or I'd initiated. As time's gone on, a lot of what's in that I don't know about until I get that, which is fantastic. And that's obviously the way it should be. Um, and it, it, you know, that is the reason people like working for us, because they can see how they're making a difference in the world and yeah, there's some stats there and you can look at it online on our, our website. But main point here really is we do put people and planet first. But since the more generous we are to people, the more we do for the planet, actually the more profit we've made. And there are obviously some other reasons for that. But it's good to know that as we give away, we actually get back. And that's what I'll be talking about in my workshop this afternoon. So if you signed up for Ben's, <laughs> no, no. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's a totally different business mindset. You know, most businesses are run on the financial bottom line and that's how they make all their decisions. And to change that, to say, actually, we're going to be generous here. We're going to do that this year. We're going to give away 10% of our profits next year. That's true, by the way. We don't know how, many, how much profit we're making next year. But no, we're going to do it anyway. And it's putting those decisions first and trusting that the profits follow. And that's a, probably a step on from B Corp in a way. So I just want to finish with this and and this is this is uh, the message that one minus one doesn't equal naught if you if we're only ever we're calculating what we can do for the world or what we can do for people purely based on whether we can afford it that is the wrong mindset that's what they'll teach you in a an mba and unless we're getting our our heart engaged then b corp just becomes a tick box, tick box exercise or ISO or ESG. I mean, I hate the terms ESG, CSR. I can't stand them. I mean, fact, you know, great. Better than doing nothing, but no. It, we, if, if B Corp, we'll hear a lot about B Corp today. If it's just a tick box thing, then it's a waste of time. It's got to go further, deeper than that. Um, ben was asking before what my fourth bottom line is, so people, planet, profit. The fourth bottom line is us, personal change. We can't do this. We'll run out of steam. If it's just a tick box exercise, we will run out of steam, we'll fizzle out, and the world won't change enough. The real change starts in here. And a big changing point for me on climate change is when I put that slide up at a Chamber of Commerce event in, in Worcestershire in 2018, I think it was, maybe 2017, and I started weeping on the stage. Which is a bit of a shock, didn't used to happen. It happens quite a lot now. But um, I said, what the hell's going on? For two minutes, I couldn't say anything. It was a bit embarrassing. Um, people haven't paid to see a grown man cry. And reflecting on it afterwards, what was happening was, for the first time, really, I know all the stats about climate change. I know 200,000 Bangladeshis get displaced from their homes every single year. It doesn't get reported in the news, by the way, because it's just normal over there. I knew that. We all know those kind of stats. But it hadn't made a difference inside me until that point. And what I was really crying about was that that all the countries that have contributed to climate change have pushed out CO2 into the atmosphere since, well, in a, in a big way, since 1760, the Industrial Revolution. And one of my ancestors in partly started the Industrial Revolution, so I do feel a, a bit of um, personal responsibility here. James Hargreaves invented the spinning jenny. All the countries that have contributed most to climate change are the ones that aren't suffering yet, anyway. They're not. 
It's all the, all the countries that haven't contributed that are suffering the consequences. And if that is only a head thing, we won't, we won't change that much. But if that goes into our hearts, we'll be passionate, we'll be driven, we won't run out of energy, we'll keep running the race, and we will be the kind of people that make a difference. And most of business... <laughs> Blimey. Uh, most of business has been on a mind level and an action level. This is, this is an MBA. This is what you learn on an MBA. It's all strategy and people in white collars making important decisions and then people, less important people, doing stuff. We talked about that a lot <coughs> in business books. A friend of mine has got a, a bookcase of about 300 business books. I actually went through them one day and made a note of all the ones that that talked about something deeper than our minds. And there was about three books on the, out of 300. Unless <coughs> we get into heart and into soul and start to change the inner parts of us, they don't teach you this on business courses. They, they, we don't talk about spirituality in the world of business. Well, whoops, I've just mentioned it. But that's what it is. Spirituality is about going deeper into our sides, ourselves and being better leaders, more compassionate for people that are working <laughs> for us, more compassionate for the planet, more compassionate for the local community around where we work. Unless we're being impacted on that level, I don't think we'll see the change that we probably all want to see. So that's my fourth bottom line. I'd encourage you today to start going deeper, not just think of the the nuts and bolts of B Corp assessment, but think of how that is impacting you as a person in love and compassion. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Do I stay here? Or I'll go. So, um, Paul, if you'd like to take a seat, I think I've turned this on. Have I turned this on? No. Anyway, you can hear me, right? Uh, I think what, what struck me about that was something which um, frustrates the hell out of me in that there are enough stats to coming out your ears every five minutes, but there is so little emotion in those stats. And you hear that you know 3.5 billion people will be migrating by the time by 2070 because the earth's too hot, blah, blah, blah. But it, they're, just, they're just numbers, right? And what I loved about that, although I wasn't expecting that first thing in the morning, was a, was a bit of bloody emotion. So thank you very much for, for showing that. And if more people could connect emotionally, we would have a lot more change a lot quicker. Right, questions. Who would like to be the very first to <laughs> ask the question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we've got about 100 people working for us. Um, but yes, at that size, you can, everyone can be into it, can't they? Then there's not, it's very obvious to everyone that works for us what we're about. And I think B Corp has certainly helped. I mean, I, I'm absolutely passionate about the B Corp movement, but it has to be a starting point and not a destination. And for us, very much starting point, but we need to move on from there. And I think anyone that works for us, they can't avoid that at that kind of size. So yeah, probably in larger organizations, it is, it is harder unless you've got those people who are passionate about it at you know, all sorts of different managerial levels if we still run our organizations like that. I mean, the, the best organizations now are moving more into self-management and um, that's probably the way forward to spread that into the organization better. The, hierarchical thing doesn't really work, if I'm honest. <laughs> Thank you. And um, over here, and then we'll go to there. Thanks. Um, just checking that was me. Uh, Fiona Raskin. Hi. Um, so it was really good to hear, like, so good to hear that, that connection piece and the emotional piece, because I feel that is missing as well. I think the more we understand everything that's going on the more it's getting into statistics and science and sort of getting mm. you know and about okay you just need to tick these boxes to do this 
and I couldn't agree more, but I'm interested to know how you think we help people create that connection and kind of move from that kind of, and you know, understanding the complexity of it, which is getting more sterile to, to actually bringing that connection. Well, in our companies, we, a lot of people have been on something what we call stepping into authentic leadership and it, it does deal with, I mean, it, it's quite often it's fear that stops us moving it onto, the, it's gone now, the right hand side of that, the heart and soul. You know, people's hang ups, stuff that's gone on in the past and there is no way of avoiding. Sometimes we need to get rid of that stuff in order to be more loving and more compassionate. So the, those courses we run, they don't have any immediate benefit for the business whatsoever, but they make people better, more healed people, and generally they end up doing, staying longer with us and, and being you know, more able to move through the fear and, and, and connect with people. I mean, that's all spirituality is for me. It's about connecting with people, connecting with the planet and connecting with yourself. So that course does quite a lot of the connecting with yourself piece, which then helps the people and the, the nature side of it as well. Cool, thank you. Um, um, this lady at the back and then we'll come to you. Yeah. A large business and then a lot of people that we're trying to kind of, <coughs> and, I, and I know obviously it's really good that we've got a senior management team that are really passionate about this, but there's always going to be people that are always going to be quite challenging to try and change their hearts and minds. Yeah, and you might not change them all. Um, generally, though, most people are kind and good, I believe that, and but there's probably 10% that, <laughs> that aren't. I mean, it is contagious though, I will say that. Um, I think as, and that we had people who were skeptical about this um, before we started going down the journey, definitely. They, actually one of those, the person I'm thinking of now, and he is actually the most evangelistic now about this because he's, he's changed quite a lot. So not everyone will change. Um, sometimes we need to move people on. <laughs> um, but generally, I think it, it comes down to people's individual fulfillment. When they're really doing this stuff, we're happier people as individuals because we're, we're, uh, the, we're yeah, homo sapiens as a, as a community mammal. We are designed to be kind and altruistic to other people. So that makes us more fulfilled as people. And people do notice, oh, well, they've changed a bit. Maybe, maybe I should have a bit of what they're having. So. Yeah, it's not a miracle cure, but you know, work in a in a small area, and hopefully the ripples will will spread out. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, think, I, I don't think business has really talked about that much. Obviously, there's a lot of talk now. Fantastic. Things have moved on a lot, haven't they, in, in the last two years on uh, mental health initiatives in, in workplaces. But I think you're spot on about not people not making that connection. Um, and it, they, I think they will because more and more young people come into the, the workplace and it is disproportionately affecting the Gen Zs, I would say, um, then I think that will start to happen. But yes, I mean, I probably haven't talked about that enough, if I'm honest with you. So thanks for the reminder. <laughs> I reckon we've got one more question in us. If anyone, yep, you were very quick. <laughs> Start if they wanted to do 
Yeah, so we have, in our retail business, we have uh, three people who are um, neurodiverse. So there's um, two autistic, one Down syndrome. And then we, we work with a local charity because uh, one of them had to move on. So we've got someone else. So we, we always have three. Um, we, they get paid. So it's just the same as everyone else treated, just the same. Needs Need a bit more help when they start, but actually they're better employees than some of the others because they're very focused on, on what they're doing. So yes, I mean, there are charities around that will help you place people like that, for example, into the business. Um, there's a charity called Working Chance, which we are linked up with Just, that is um, female prisoners coming back into the workplace. So I would just suggest making those links with organizations who, well, basically they're particularly at the moment, that there's huge opportunities to change. The neurodiversity has been massively neglected in terms of companies not taking them on because they're worried about what might happen. Well, actually, no. These are better people for certain roles. So work with local charities, and that will be my recommendation. Yeah. Well, so, Paul, can I just um, thank you <clears throat> for such an amazing emotional connection to start the day with? Um, and thank you to everybody who has listened and asked questions. A big round of applause, please, for Paul. There are books available at the back which are in the break. I just, they weren't free, by the way. We did, there isn't a sign. Uh, if you've taken a book and haven't paid for it, let me know. <laughs> uh, drop that one at the end. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to have to go some to win some of his workshop people over to me. I can see the challenge already there. Um, anyway, moving on, moving on. Graham, we have next speaker is uh, Graham Donoghue, Chief Exec of Sykes, previously held illustrious roles at TUI and uh, Money Supermarket. Graham, over to you. Thank you. I think I'm going to steal Paul's money. I need one, but I'll take it anyway. Uh, thank you. And... Um, I mean, <clears throat> what an act to follow. Uh, super impressive. We were chatting before. Oh, thank you. We were chatting before about the sort of the journey that Paul has sort of gone through. And, and, and really, I'm going to give you a view of, uh, I guess, a larger business. We are a larger business, just 